So I'm delighted to be giving the last lecture in this series on divas, but I have to say that when I first announced the topic of this series, I did get one question and reaction quite a lot, which was, is Julie Andrews a diva? Indeed, one or two people have been very angry with me about just including her. So I'm having to do something which I didn't expect to do, which is to address why I think that she's a diva. And I thought I would jump straight in with this one. So I give you an example from her debut film in 1964. You may have seen it called Mary Poppins, of what I think of as an undoubted diva moment. The honey bees that fetch the nectar from the flowers to the comb Never tire of ever buzzing to and fro Because they take a little nip from every flower that they sip And hence, and hence, they find, they find Their task is not a It calls to mind a kind of diva that we haven't looked at yet in the series, one that is less serious, perhaps, than some of the more heavyweight kinds of divas that we've looked at. And it reminded me of something that I saw quite recently, which was a famous concert that Maria Callas, one of the undoubted divas of the middle of the 20th century, gave in Paris in 1958. And in the middle of this very serious program of opera arias, she sang... Rosina's aria from the Barber of Seville, which is a comic piece, and something about the personality of this performance reminds me of the Mary Poppins moment as a way to kind of contextualize something about their characters. So let's have a quick look at this clip. <laughs> You see, you can generate power and therefore be a diva through humor and charm and not just through being serious and kind of belting people in this very heavy way. And so if we return to my magic matrix of diva words, <clears throat> which I've shown in the previous lectures, this time I have turned all the pejorative words that we might associate with the concept of the diva red, because I think most of them don't really apply to Julie Andrews's public image, but most of the green ones do. She is talented and an idol and an icon and outstanding. And in her case, she has achieved this a lot through the lightness of her voice and initially through her coloratura singing and her high singing. And a lot of her early film appearances contain these moments where she shows off the top of her voice at strategic moments. So here's an example from a 1968 film called Star, which you may or may not have known. It was a big flop. And at the end of this song, The Saga of Jenny, she shows off how high she can sing. Anyone with vision comes to this decision. You mustn't make up. You mustn't make up. Shouldn't make up. like waiting for the number 10 bus, isn't it? It goes on forever. And it seems to me that the power of her voice was the thing that really articulated her as a great diva in the 60s, even if these performances tend to be fun rather than severe. And even her most iconic moment on screen in the whole of her career strikes me as a diva moment, because although she's dressed in an incredibly plain way, there is something about the way that it's filmed with a helicopter zooming in with a camera attached to it, and the way that the orchestra builds thanks to a brilliant arrangement by Erwin Kostel, that leads us to have this kind of impact that, to me, only belongs to a diva.
I mean, she climbs up to the mountains and gets the camera to come to her, so how much of a diva can you be? And all of this goes back to the very beginning of her career, which was when she was a child, and she, was, she became known very quickly as Britain's youngest prima donna because of the impact of her voice. And in particular, her first really major appearance at the age of 12 in a variety show called Starlight Roof. And you can see her name in that photograph on the right there. One of the smallest names in the billing, of course, because she's not a major star. And, but she's appearing alongside a number of major stars. And when we look at the reviews of this performance, we can see that they consistently talk about her as actually outshining the stars on opening night. And they use words like radiant and prima donna to describe her. So I think of these as synonyms of the word diva. So I'm going to stop going on about why I think she's a diva at this point. But again, the review in the stage calls her a youthful prima donna, fully entitled to her remarkable reception for some beautiful singing. The rather quaintly titled Accordion Times and Musical Express, which wasn't around for nearly long enough as far as I'm concerned, referred to her as the kid who stops the show in the first half. And I found this lovely column from November 1947, so a week after Starlight Roof opened, and it, um, it's been very badly scanned by the Hollywood Reporter, so I've transcribed it for you. And it begins, ever heard of Julie Andrews? Nope. Well, I guess you soon will. She walked onto the stage of the London Hippodrome where Vic Oliver's new show, Starlight Roof, was being premiered last night, sang in a voice of exquisite purity, the Polonaise from Mignon, during which she reached F above top C and brought the house down. You see, folks, Julie is only 12 years old, and that's why she was the hit of the evening. Now, the following March, she went into a recording studio and actually recorded this um, little performance. So I thought that we would listen to some of it now. We haven't got all night, so I have very unmusically removed the middle of the song. But it begins with a little conversation between Julie Andrews and Vic Oliver, who was the guy who was the sort of lead figure in this review. And it ends with her coloratura dynamics. So take a listen to the 12-year-old Julie Andrews. Ladies and gentlemen, I have great pleasure in introducing to you our youngest soprano from Starlight Roof, Julie Andrews. Well, Julie, is this the first time you've ever made a gramophone record? Oh, yes. Is it your first record, too? <laughs> no, no, not exactly, no. How old are you? I am 12. How old are you? Uh, <clears throat> um, I think I'd better ask the questions. What are you going to sing for us? I'd like to sing the Polonaise from Mimi. Oh, lovely. Just the kind of junk I like. in the opera house and indeed she's not really using vibrato most of the way through that which is very peculiar in operatic terms and I'm certainly not saying that she's a, a Maria Callas type of singer but there is something impactful there and it really caused a stir I found this interview from November 1947 with a man who was a ventriloquist who appeared in the very first Royal Command performance in 1912 and he started agitating to say that she should be allowed to be in the Royal Variety performance. And the following October, it was announced that she would appear as a featured artist. 
alongside Danny Kay, who was a major star by this point, um, and sing her great aria in the Royal Variety Performance, and she led the national anthem. So she was really going up in at least the country, if not the world, by the age of 13 at this point. And it might be easy to think from all of this that therefore she had this rosy upbringing and easy ascent, but in actual fact, it's very clear from her autobiography that her background was very difficult. Her father, Ted Wells, was a teacher of woodwork and metalwork. Her mother was a pianist. And when, they were, when she was about seven years old, when Julie was about seven years old, her parents broke up and her mother went off with a professional singer from Canada called Ted Andrews. So two Teds, both father figures, which is a bit complicated. And they renamed her from Julia Wells to Julie Andrews, and she was forced to take her stepfather's name. And then when she was 15 or so, she describes having been taken to a party of a family friend. Um, and then afterwards, on the way home, her mother told her that that was her biological father. So she then had a third father figure in her life whom um, she seems not to have really engaged with, and she very much regarded Ted Wells as her father figure. But you can see that life was very difficult. Something else um, that happened was that then she went to live in London during the Blitz with her stepfather and her mother, and she talks about going to live in Mornington Crescent, what a curse, and having to um, live in this apartment where there wasn't enough space for them all to sleep. So a room in the basement of the building was taken over, some kind of utility room, and she describes how two barred windows revealed a wall mere inches behind them. The place was freshened up, but after the first 24 hours, we kept the lights on, she says, all night, as rats would emerge and creep along the pipe. So another difficult part of her childhood. And then she, jo she joined her um, stepfather and mother's act, and they started going around the country together, but eventually she was hired to do performances on her own. So, for example, when all three of them were in Blackpool, her stepfather and mother were appearing on the kind of end of the pier show, and she was appearing at the Blackpool Hippodrome Theatre in a, a kind of much more significant production. So this, too, caused some tension. She then started to um, encounter puberty and started to find that her voice was changing, and she said that I found I was losing the top no notes of my voice and it was beginning to mature, so the white, thin quality that had defined her coloratura was becoming warmer, richer, and she began to worry, she says, since the little girl with the high voice image was still her gimmick. So she talks very vividly in her book about the kind of the difficult transition she had to make already at this point in her career when she was still kind of a mid-teenager into a different kind of performer. And one of the things she did was to perform um, the first of her major musical theatre roles, which was Polly in The Boyfriend on Broadway. And what's noticeable to me, having re-watched all her films recently and thought about them all, is how often she has played a character who undergo, undergoes some kind of change and becomes somebody else, often quite quickly during the story. In Thoroughly Modern Millie, she stops being this prim Edwardian woman and becomes a flapper within about 30 seconds of the beginning of the film, but that plot point becomes a tension throughout the story, that the whole time she's pretending to be someone that she's not. And of course, in My Fair Lady, she's a flower girl, pretends to be a duchess. In two versions of Cinderella, she becomes a princess. In The Sound of Music, she goes from being a nun into a baroness and all the rest of it. And it seems to me that this aspect of transformation is at the heart of her success as a performer in that she seems to embody this sense of um, social mobility that a lot of the audience could feel. My Fair Lady was her really big breakthrough role in 1956 on Broadway. It ran for six and a half years, although not with her. It got the best reviews of a generation. People said it was the best musical for 25 years. And so she had real impact here, did it on Broadway, and then came and did it in London. But famously, she was replaced in the 1964 Jack Warner film version by Audrey Hepburn, who was a bigger star at the time. And this is something that was discussed quite openly 
at the time, indeed by Julie Andrews herself, who went off and made Mary Poppins instead of My Fair Lady. And she performed quite a zinger when she accepted her award at the Golden Globes that year and thanked Jack Warner for not having cast her in My Fair Lady because if she'd done it, she would have ended up not winning the Oscar and the Golden Globe for Finally, my Mary thanks Poppins. to a man who made a wonderful movie and who made all this possible in the first place, Mr. Jack Warner. <laughs> <laughs> Never tell me she's not a diva. Let's consider um, quite briefly the differences or the difference between Audrey Hepburn and Julie Andrews's performance in this role. I mean, we could go on for an hour just about this point of analysis, but trying to encapsulate what I think one of the big points of difference between them is, let's take a look at the second verse of the song Show Me from the second half of the story. First of all, we're going to see Audrey Hepburn with Jeremy Brett there, both of them dubbed in the film. And um, Hepburn is dubbed by Marnie Nixon, who dubbed many famous actresses um, in Hollywood. It would ought to be a dream. Say one more word and I'll scream. Haven't your arms hungered for mine? Please don't explain. Show me, show me. Don't wait until wrinkles and lines pop out all over my bra. Show me no. It is a beautifully filmed moment, but it's quite sung by Marnie Nixon, which you can understand because in films we don't tend to get that so much of that kind of actuary type of singing. But if we look at Julie Andrews doing the same number almost around the same time. This is from a television special. Unfortunately, the, the, um, it's, it's a bit too bright and overexposed, but you can still get a sense of how different her characterization is, especially from the point of view of her singing. Haven't your lips longed for my touch? Don't say how much. Show me, show me. Don't talk of love lasting through time. Make me no undying apart. There's something much more vigorous about the way that she does it. And to me, the thing that she does is to keep alive the flower girl bit of Eliza Doolittle. And it's partly through the singing. She does an awful lot of acting through her singing. And it's not got that same sweet quality that we get in Marnie Nixon's version, and which seems to hold Audrey Hepburn back in that song and in a lot of her songs. And while I don't really blame Marnie Nixon at all, I think it's a very difficult gig to get to dub Audrey Hepburn in My Fair Lady. And indeed, Audrey Hepburn is already kind of the duchess when she sets out. So a very difficult um, task for her, whereas Andrews kind of understands this journey a bit more and manages to express it. The other thing that started to come through in some of these earlier appearances, this one is from Rodgers and Hammerstein's Cinderella, which was a, a television musical written specially for her and um, broadcast it is said to over 100 million people in March 1957 performed live, is that the um, first octave of her voice, the lower part of her voice, is incredibly expressive. Because she's a soprano, she doesn't have to work too hard to create the singing in that part of her voice, but she's able to really finesse the sound and put the yearning across. And I've chosen a bit of the duet from Cinderella that she performs with the prince to kind of encapsulate that feeling, because I do think she has the ability to touch listeners and viewers through her singing in a way that's quite particular. Do I want you because you're wonderful? Are you wonderful because I want you? Are you the sweet invention of a lover? Yeah. 
play more royalty in her next Broadway appearance, which was the, the musical Camelot. And as is well known, this was a very troubled production whereby the designer died before they even started rehearsing and the director had a heart attack and the writer ended up in hospital as well. So it was very difficult for them to refine a very difficult story at exactly the period where they needed to. But what's interesting is looking at the reviews of Camelot when it was in Boston before it had made it to New York, is that the audience is clearly reacting very badly to the spectacle of Julie Andrews as Queen Guinevere cheating on King Arthur with Lancelot du Lac because it was Julie Andrews. So for the first time, she was encountering the problems of her own image in, wanting, in doing what she wanted to do artistically. And it was a difficult experience, I think. She writes very movingly in her memoirs about how she feels about live theatre, and I'm sorry to read out such a long quote, but I think it's so particular, having read both of her memoirs now, the way that she writes about this is quite different from the way she writes about anything else. So let's take a look. She says, to describe now what theatre means to me and what the work feels like is difficult. One is usually so busy attempting to find answers and hone them into honesty focusing on the moment and its progression, sending it out and finding the well of energy that it takes. My feelings about it shift and change on any given day. Once in a while, I experience an emotion on stage that's so gut-wrenching, so heart-stopping, that I could weep with gratitude and joy. The feeling catches and magnifies so rapidly that it threatens to engulf me. It starts as a bass note, resonating deep in my system. Literally, it's like the warmest, lowest sound from a contrabass. There's a sudden thrill of connection and awareness of size. Um, the the theatre itself, where history has been absorbed, where darkness contains mystery and light has meaning. Light is a part of it, to be flooded with it, to absorb it and allow it through the body. Most of all, it's the music, when a great sweep of sound makes you attempt things that earlier in the day you might never have thought possible when the orchestra swells to support your voice, when the melody is perfect and the words so right there could not possibly be any others and that is the moment to share it. One senses the audience feeling it too and together you ride the ecstasy all the way home. So she doesn't write about recording albums like this or about making films like this or being in a pantomime like this. She's very specific about the medium and yet she didn't appear in a musical again for over 30 years on the stage. And instead, she went to Hollywood and became a movie star. And what I really like looking at the, the list of the first seven films that she made in Hollywood is that she really was a proper movie star. I think that probably the general public doesn't always realize this about her, but only the movies in green are musicals and the other, one are, the other ones are non-musical films. So, for example, The Americanization of Emily is a very serious, interesting anti-war movie quite ahead of its time. She's very good in it. Torn Curtain is one of Hitchcock's slightly weaker films, but she's very good in it. She plays the fiancé of um, Paul Newman, who is a scientist, an American scientist, and who appears to defect to East Germany, but is actually going to try and find out how far they have developed their anti-missile systems and what they understand about it. So poor Julie goes along for the ride and doesn't know whether he's doing bad things or good things. And she has to embody, through quite a weak screenplay, that feeling that the audience feels of not knowing what's going on because it's not revealed for quite a long time. But the one that really stuck with me re-watching all these films was Hawaii, which is definitely a problematic and not a, a brilliant piece of screen making. It's, over two and a half hours long in its complete version. And it's one of those epic 1960s Hollywood films that seem to go on forever. They've had so much money thrown at them that the, the story gets a bit buried. And it's certainly a problematic story in some ways. But there is a scene two hours into the film, which we're going to see a bit of, where she confronts the character of her husband. So her husband is a Calvinist missionary who's gone to Hawaii to introduce Christianity. Not at all problematic. And by this point in the film, the population has started to die off because of a me measles outbreak. So lots of people die. And her husband takes a very 
hard view of this and says it was God's will that they died. And finally, Julie, who's been given lots of very passive scenes to play up to this point, speaks the conscience of the audience and kind of articulates the problems with colonialism. If I did not believe, I could not call myself a Christian. Then I will no longer call myself a Christian. I don't believe in your God of wrath. I don't believe Kaoki's in hell either. I believe he has found God and Malava with him and Kilolo and all those who died there on the beach. But it's impossible for the unbaptized to enter heaven. Oh, Abner, I've never seen a people more generous, more loving, more filled with Christian sweetness than these. I will not believe that God has rejected them simply because they haven't been baptized. Not even that lost child whose birth you cursed. These things are God's will, not mine. What else but God's wrath has the power to annihilate them? Disease, despair, our lack of love, our inability to find them beautiful, our contempt for their ways, our lust for their land, our greed, our arrogance. That is what kills them, Abner. It's really interesting seeing her in these non-musical roles because there's none of the trappings of the sound of music here. And she's very good in most of these films. She, I think she's been very misfortunate in being the best thing about a number of these less famous films, and she often manages to transcend a very mixed material. Anyway, in the middle of this period, she also made the first of her... Um, famous television specials with the Broadway star and TV star Carol Burnett. And they did a rather cheeky thing, which was to take over the classical music venue, Carnegie Hall, and to um, put on a kind of review show, a bit like the kind that she would have known as a child, and kind of mock all kinds of things that were going on in society at the time. And the one that became by far the most significant to her career, although she would not know it yet, I believe, was a number called From Switzerland, The Pratt Family. We are the happy Swiss family, Pratt. We bring you a happy song that I used to sing when I was a happy nun back home in Switzerland. <laughs> And what this helps us to tap into is the fact that when The Sound of Music opened in 1959 and ran in New York, it was a big hit, very popular. It was by Rodgers and Hammerstein and Lindsay and Krauss, the great writers of the day. But it was also an open joke amongst a lot of the more sophisticated people in New York. And, uh, and so in this number, of course, they are mocking the song My Favourite Things, and they go on to mock some of the other songs from The Sound of Music, which helps to explain why, when they made the film, The Sound of Music, changes had to be happen, and some of these had to happen. Some of these changes were just to address the fact that she was a different kind of singer from Mary Martin, who'd played the role of Maria von Trapp on Broadway. So, for example, at the end of the song Do Re Mi, Mary Martin does a, a long scale downwards and shows how low she can sing, whereas in the film version, they change it to show off Julie's high B flat. In fact, it's a particularly fruity note that she comes out with at the end. That would bring us back to so do ra ba mi do re so do la ba ti la so do ti do so do was the popularity of the sound of music amongst the public that there became this sort of fatigue of poor Julie Andrews. And uh, when I was re-watching the second of the specials that she made with Carol Burnett, I found in this big medley that they did of hits from the 1960s, there's a moment where Carol Burnett seems to speak for all of the snooty critics of the East Coast of America when she interrupts Julie Andrews singing 
a song that we've already heard. Pull yourself together. It's just a song. I mean, remember, just a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. The medicine go down. The medicine go down. Just a spoonful oh, of sugar. I mean, she very successfully sends herself up here, but there is something about the oh shut up that seems to encapsulate something slightly wider culturally. To be fair, that the initial critics' reactions to the film The Sound of Music were generally quite negative, especially from the East Coast critics. And Julie herself got generally positive reviews, but the film itself was completely reviled, and no one um, in the press thought that this was going to be a big hit, and so I wanted to show you some of the clips from the review. For example, in The New Yorker, I felt myself drowning in a pit of sticky sweet whipped cream, not of the first freshness. <laughs> and then there's a very famous review in a women's magazine called McCall's, where supposedly, and I don't know if it's true, but I suspect it's true, supposedly the critic was sacked from her job as a result of saying this about The Sound of Music. It's the sugar-coated lie that people seem to want to eat. And it is the attitude that makes a critic feel that maybe it's hopeless. Why not just send the director, Robert Wise, a wire? You win, I give up. <laughs> and the New York Times was unkind soon, uh, too, and said the adults are fairly horrendous, especially poor Christopher Plummer. And a few days after this review, um, Bosley Crowther of the New York Times wrote a special feature called The Soundness of Musicals and basically said that the sound of music was going to be the end of the movie musical form because it had set the musical film back 20 years with disappointing reversions to the old operetta form. It's all sterile. As a musical film, it's not fresh. It's not sound. So I think when things started to go wrong for her, they were kind of pleased, although... According to the Guinness Book of World Records 2015, it has had or had had a worldwide gross of over $2.3 billion. So in the midst of all of this, her life came under great pressure. And in this interview, which we'll see a clip of now, she starts talking about the personal impact that all of this success had. I mean, in 1965, when The Sound of Music opened, she was only 30 years old, and she'd already been working for 20 years. It's kind of crackers. And she started to slightly fall apart. I was so busy doing and absorbing and, and having a considerable success just hit me that I think, A, it knocked me sideways a little bit because you can imagine there was a great deal of, of an assault by press and publicity and, and, and things like that. But secondly, I didn't have much time to get perspective on it all, not until much, much later. Uh and... Her first marriage to the designer, um, Tony Walton, fell apart at this point, and a couple of years later, she met and married the director, Blake Edwards, best known for things like The Pink Panther and Breakfast at Tiffany's, so one of the great directors of America. But these were two very different people, and one of the consequences of their marriage is that they did decide to work together quite a bit. And if we look at the next 20 years of her uh, movie output, we can see that the majority of them were directed by him, only two of them musicals. Now, this was problematic in a way because they were very different as artists, both exceptional but very different in style. And he went in a lot of the time for a very broad kind of humor, as we see from things like The Pink Panther. And she, to me, is all about finesse. And so finding points of meeting was often quite difficult. <clears throat> There were points of meeting, including, in my opinion, the opening song of that first film they made together, Darling Lily, which I think I've mis misspelt. It's with one L in the middle. Anyway, um, the opening number of this film that they made together, the first one, Darling Lily, really shows how well they could work together. Take a look at this. Often I think my poor old heart has given Good. And then I see a brand new face. I glimpse some new neighborhood. So walk me back home, my darling. Tell me dreams really come true. Sing. 
and beautiful and the, the use of the lights in it are so spectacular that you believe you're about to sit down and watch the most intriguing and wonderful film that you've ever seen in your life because she's singing so beautifully here and, and she's using the lower point of her, of her voice quite significantly going below middle C. It's quite low for a soprano. But from there, you discover that the film is going to be a kind of spoof about an English performer who is actually a German spy during the First World War. And at times it descends into Pink Panther type of humor and kind of unsettles the magic of what we're seeing there. It was a terrible box office disaster and critical disaster and brought an end to her musicals for some years. In 1974, they made a thriller together called The Tamarind Seed with Omar Sharif, which is actually a very watchable film, as I reminded myself the other week. A very good film, but it's not a, an exceptional film and not an important film. And then after that, it was five years before she made another film, and she appeared in one of Blake Edwards' most iconic movies, Ten, opposite Dudley Moore, who is the real main character of the movie. The problem with this one, as far as she's concerned, is that, again, she's exceptionally good and very sassy in the film, but she plays the long-suffering girlfriend, while Dudley Moore is obsessed in a rather predatory way with Bo Derek, and he's having a sort of midlife crisis, and she just is there on the sidelines getting a bit fed up. So, for example, we can see in this little clip how sassy she is, and how much she stands up for herself. But really, I'm not sure how this is enhancing her overall image. First, I'm getting a little fed up at sexually emancipated ladies being referred to as broads. Second, I think a telescope aimed at anything other than the stars is an invasion of privacy and qualifies the voyeur as a peeping Tom. And there's a very good law against that. Third, the first two really wouldn't bother me a bit if you'd stop watching so goddamn much television and pay a little more attention to your bedroom guests, this guest in particular. Now, you want to argue or you want to make love? It's very good, but it's kind of how it's contributing to her image overall, I'm not sure, other than it shows she can be tough. And certainly she's moving away there from her Sound of Music, Mary Poppins type of image. But because she's kind of secondary to the story, it's a bit frustrating that she doesn't have something meaty to do. But there was one film they made together, which was a big hit, called Victor Victoria in 1982. And this seemed like a great meeting of um, the, the mixtures of their artistic temperaments, if you like. She is given this role of Victor, who is a female impersonator, so she's pretending to be a man, pretending to be a woman. And it allows her to show off that lower point part of the voice that we've seen developing gradually over these years of her career. And again, he, Blake Edwards employs the same sorts of filming and lighting techniques, especially in this song, Crazy World, that we've seen at the beginning of Darling Ellie. So it's a bit like he goes back into his toolbox and brings out something again that worked very well and this time makes a hit of it. Crazy world Full of crazy contradictions Like a child First you drive me wild And then you Temperamental as a summer storm Just when I believe your heart's getting warmer You're cold and you're cruel And I, like a fool, try to cope Try to If 
my pitching is correct, I think she goes down to an E below middle C, which is very low indeed for someone that's famous as a soprano. And so there is some kind of artistic growth for her here in that she's setting up the ability to be very expressive in a different part of her voice. And the, the, um, the RP, the received pronunciation for which she's so famous, really comes into play here because she's able to use those vowel sounds to make this really beautiful, expressive and intimate sound that the camera really loves her here. You can feel Blake Edwards sort of loving her and really wanting to show her off at her absolute best and show her off in a new way. The two films that I have found most curious revisiting her entire output both came out in 1986. The, um, the first one was That's Life, which was the last film that she made with Blake Edwards and which was completely improvised. He wrote uh, a kind of treatment, so a description of what everyone should be improvising about, but basically they gathered a load of their friends and colleagues and made a film together, a heavily autobiographical film about Blake Edwards and kind of covered up by pretending that Jack Lemmon is an, well, he plays an architect, but he's supposed to be Blake Edwards. But what's psychologically interesting in the film is that she plays a singer who in the opening scene of the film is shown undergoing a biopsy on her throat for a growth that has been found. And so in the second scene of the film, we see her in a car having a discussion with her doctor about whether it's benign or malign, because they're going to have to wait all weekend to find out, and what this is going to mean for her future. And so this becomes incredibly psychologically curious, because 11 years later, this kind of thing sort of happened to her, in that she underwent, very famously, an operation. And so watching this particular clip now, where she ends with a particular question, really has taken on a new meaning that is remarkable, given what subsequently happened, and is very famous. Are you going to tell anyone? <coughs> what for? Sometimes. If it's benign, I'll hit it. C above top C. No, no, not a great idea. Well, if it's malignant, they'll know soon enough about it anyway. <coughs> what if it is malignant? We'll talk about that when we know. I want to talk about it now. Am I going to be able to sing again? this question, am I going to be able to sing again? It just sits there in midair because, of course, this became the big question of the latter part of her career. The other film from 1986, Duet for One, which was based on a play, she plays a violinist who has been diagnosed with multiple sclerosis before the film begins. And the film is about how a violinist is going to come to terms with not being able to play the violin anymore. So both of these films ask the question, what is an artist who can't make art anymore? Um, the fact that they were back to back and both filmed when she was 50 years old, it all seems psychologically rather heavy in hindsight, i.e. not just another film, it seems to have this autobiographical dimension. Before we get to her vocal crisis, she did return to the stage for two productions. First of all, in 1993, she was in uh, a review of Stephen Sondheim's songs and got largely exceptionally good reviews. It said, um, for example, in Variety, looking and sounding as though it's been 30 days since her last stage appearance instead of 30 years. Julie Andrews is radiant in her return. So very good review indeed. And <clears throat> some of the songs that are allocated to her provide new opportunities to show off particularly entertaining skills. So for example, here is a song called Getting Married Today. Life. Pardon me, is everybody there? Because if everybody's there, I want to thank you all for coming to the wedding. I'd appreciate you going even more. I mean, you must have lots of better things to do and not a word of it to Paul. Remember, Paul, you know the man I'm going to marry, but I'm not because I wouldn't ruin anyone as wonderful as he is. Thank you all for the gifts and the flowers. Thank you all. Now it's back to the showers. Don't tell Paul that I'm not getting married today. This is someone having a nervous breakdown on their wedding day and sort of remembering it in, in a very tense way. And I, I guess that they felt that since she had managed supercalifragilisticexpialidocious, she could manage that one. And then the big return to the stage was the stage version of Victor Victoria from 1995. So she had turned 60 in this one. And this was the, the final big production of her career. And it did cause her problems in the end because 
of the fatigue involved. But the filmed version of it, it was filmed for Japanese television, and you can get it on DVD now, reveals that she's still incredibly expressive down there in that lower part of her voice. Living in the shadows, hiding from the sunlight, hiding from the one light that might help to guide you. So she was still very much Julie Andrews. But during this production, it ran for 20 months. It took a long time for it to make its money back. And although she did have some holiday time, she started to miss some performances um, towards the end of the run because of vocal fatigue. And as she has talked about in many interviews, they found um, a problem in her throat and her surgeon advised her to get surgery. And as is well known, this led her to lose her singing voice and it became a big issue that was discussed widely in the press. They settled out of court. The figure has never been confirmed, but it was said to be something like 20 million was how much she was um, given as a, a settlement. So a really difficult um, moment for her because she was not able to end her singing career and her artistic career on her own terms. However, in October 2000, so now 65, she was invited to host a concert on Broadway called My Favourite Broadway, The Love Songs. And so she was just introducing everything. And at the end, Michael Crawford came on and sang I've Grown Accustomed to Her Face from My Fair Lady. And the reviewer in Variety reports that um, after the end of the song, Andrews sidled up to him to utter, the rain in Spain stays mainly on the plain. She then sang the vocal reply, on the plain, on the plain, by George, she's got it, Andrews will sing again. A mere half dozen notes brought a capacity audience cheering to its feet, celebrating a comeback for that singing voice since botched throat surgery robbed the public of her glorious tones, and thankfully, it was filmed. The rain in Spain stays mainly in the plain. <laughs> I think she's got it! The rain in Spain stays mainly in the plain. By George, she's got it! By George, she's got it! Now once again, where does it rain? On the plain, on the plain. Where's that sunny plain? In Spain, in Spain. And this shows us how context can have such an impact on an audience because she's hardly doing anything. She sings sort of three or four notes. And yet, because everyone believed that she couldn't sing anymore, she was still able to have that impact and everybody cheered and stood up. So even now, when she could no longer sing and she never did properly sing again, she proved that she was a diva. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dominic, for that wonderful lecture. I'm Milton Mermakides, the Professor of Music here, and I'll be fielding some questions. There's some online already. Actually, this one came in eight weeks ago, so very keen. <laughs> it's about time you answered it. And then perhaps after, we'll um, send the microphone round for the room. Um, this Slido is still active if you're shy and want to send them to me directly. So, Anonymous says, would you say that her enormous success in Mary Poppins and The Sound of Music came as both a curse and a blessing, loved by the whole world, but bracketed? I guess so, but I think at the time what happened was overexposure. So it wasn't so much that her image was necessarily set, although we saw a bit of self-parody around that specific point in that Carol and, and Julie duet, but I think the problem was that when someone is successful in several films in a row, it's not so much the image that's the problem, it's the, the problem is that people start to resent seeing, you know, she's now in a Hitchcock film, and even the Hitchcock film did quite well commercially, it wasn't a flop, and, and so I think that it was that sort of fatigue and frustration, and, and people went for her. And also she, it must have been very difficult for her, as I said in the lecture, to deal with having been performing since she was a child and just never stopped. You know, going from being in the London Palladium pantomime and then, 
in The Boyfriend on Broadway, and then My Fair Lady on Broadway, and then making these TV musicals, and then making Camelot, and then making Mary Poppins. It's, it's, so much, it's too much success for anyone to really manage, it seems to me. It's, it must have been just exhausting psychologically, and, and there's almost a sense of, did, did she lose a sense of who she was? Because she's just so caught up in, in being the public, Julie Andrews. Speaking of that, in her autobiography, um, you identified her love of singing live. She must have had enough power to choose those elements of her career, did she not? Why do you think she had such a hiatus from singing live? Uh, well, she um, had a daughter after Camelot, so um, she had a sort of fairly short career break, actually, but had a daughter and then went and made Mary Poppins. And Walt Disney came to see Camelot and said, oh, come to Hollywood and, and make Mary Poppins. So she wasn't going to turn that one down. And I guess then the succession of offers meant, you know, why, why wouldn't you do, why wouldn't you make all these movies? And you can't be in both. And as we know, even today, often Hollywood stars want to be in stage productions, but then it takes up too much of their time and they can't make as much money. So... Yes, yeah, she did have the power, but... Can you explain the, um, the decision behind the dubbing? Why would they dub Julie Andrews? In the... They didn't dub Julie Andrews. They yeah. dubbed Audrey Hepburn. Audrey Hepburn, yes. Yeah, so. In the film, My okay, Fair Lady. So. Yeah, they didn't dub Julie Andrews as far as I know. Um, do we have a question in the audience? Thank you very much. Is there any truth to the rumour that she swore like a uh, sailor on stage. On stage? Or, you know, oh, you, in putting it together, yes. Yes, she did. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's public knowledge. It's on the cast album, you can hear her swearing. And there are wonderful YouTube videos of outtakes of television specials that she made where she swears a lot. So yes, she's sweary, but probably charming with it. So, oh. Um, <clears throat> thank you for another excellent lecture. Um, I believe you said this is the last mm -hmm. in the series. Um, if there were such a prize, who would you award the prize of uh, Diva Senior of Diva? Diva. <laughs> senior Diva. I think it would be misogynistic for me as a man to stand up and say, well, she's the biggest diva of them all. So, but, and, and what I've been trying to get at is, is sort of that all three of these women, and indeed any women in this type of profession, have a lot of texture to who they are, and that there's many different elements to who they are, and that they can be very different as women, but their performances can generate power for them as women. And something that I didn't have time to get into, but I was originally going to in the series, was the idea of this being the period of second wave feminism, a time when women were struggling to get power in society and politically. It was the period when the pill became available. It was all of those sorts of um, things were being fought for. And to me, it's about understanding these women as part of that period, because all three of them became big exactly in the 1960s. All three of them did some work before, but basically they are 1960s women, and that's why I call them 20th century divas. I think there's something very particular about the different kinds of femininity that they inhabit. But all three of them are powerful from it. The other thing I noticed, which I didn't expect to notice, is that all three of them had difficult upbringings. So there was a definite uh, impulse for them to get out because Streisand lost her father because he died. Bassie lost her father. All of them were brought up by stepfathers or other people. Things were very broken. They, didn't, um, they weren't brought up with a lot of money. So that need to use their power for their voices for power and make careers and make money was uh, common to all three of them, even though Julie Andrews and Shirley Bassey are completely different in so many other respects. And the other thing is all three of them had to stop singing at some point in their career for one reason or another, because Bassie had psychological problems around the death of her daughter, Streisand got stage fright, Andrews had the operation, and all three of them managed to get singing again. So that was something else that I admire about them and seems part of this 
feeling that they're powerful women, even though they sound completely different and how they present themselves is completely different. So I'm not willing to say one is more of a diva. <laughs> Uh, was she ever approached to be in any of the Lloyd Webber musicals? And how do you think she would have done as uh, Evita? How would she have done Evita? I mean, I don't think she would have been vocally appropriate as Evita. I can't imagine anyone thinking of that as um, commercial, as a thing at the time. I have no idea whether she ever talked to Andrew Lloyd Webber about something. I think there were many projects over her career that she was supposed to do or that she was approached to do or she considered doing. I can't think of an Andrew Lloyd Webber one off the top of my head. Um, it would have been too late in her career to be in The Phantom of the Opera, which I suppose might have been. She could have played Christine, maybe, but if she'd been a different age, but not in 1986. So I'm sorry, I can't think of anything interesting to say about that. <laughs> I have one here. Why cool. do you think that Julie Andrews' hour, which you might know, which she did in 72, 73, tanked? Oh dear. Mm -hmm. She dan danced, sang, and had famous people on, but <laughs> it never caught on with the audience. Was that part of fatigue, or it was early fatigue? I think it's part of fatigue. I think um, this was a, a sort of television variety concert show type of thing that she made. It's a very 1950s, 1960s concept. So to be doing it in 1972, I think, was part of the the problem. And I've seen some of it, and I think that the quality is very mixed, and she talks about that herself in her book, where, you know, having to dream up an hour of television singing and routines every week, for Huge weeks and weeks, is, is too much. So they probably would have needed to take two years to plan it and then execute it. I think there's something like 24 episodes, 22 episodes, so, so half that. of the year was taken up with making these specials. Uh, Any more in the room? I have one more here. Uh, one of the common things that's come out in all, all three divas that you've covered seems to be a sense that sometimes not taking themselves quite so seriously, being able to send themselves up. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's part of the power of being a, a, a diva, do you think? Yes, I do, but, and, and it's where sometimes actually Streisand has slightly struggled with that. She's, she's done it sometimes, but not so much. And I think it's about acknowledging how some of the audience feels. So by acknowledging that some of these things are said about them and then lampooning it, they're actually able to take back the power through that process. Whereas if they try to ignore that people um, are making fun of them or aren't taking them very seriously, then you sort of become more of a self-parody, whereas for her to allow herself to sit there and sing A Spoonful of Sugar and have Carol Burnett tell her to shut up, it was just clever, because it's acknowledging what people are perhaps feeling, even though the audience cheers when she starts singing the song and she had many admirers and followers. It's not the case that everyone turned against her. It's just, I think, that she, she came up across um, problems with the press, and they were... They were already after The Sound of Music when it first opened, so when she started making things like um, Star and Darling Lily that are um, objectively weaker films and not so co coherent and, and maybe lack sparkle, then you know, they were ready to pounce on her. So being able to laugh at herself, I think, was indeed a powerful thing to do. Well, with that, I'd like to thank Dominic for a wonderful lecture, a wonderful series, and we look forward to next year's lectures. Thank you. Very much.